Well, let me ask you this question. Are you a patient person? Now, if you want to, uh, if you're sitting by someone, maybe ask them that question about you, and I'm sure, I'm sure they'll quickly know the answer. But if you're not sure whether you're a patient person or not, let me give you not quite a scientific test, but I think it will do the job. So question one, is fast food just not fast enough to you? I mean, you can, you can pick your favorite fast food restaurant. Let's say Chick-fil-A, especially for all of those of you that live in Altoona or State College or the surrounding areas. Do you find yourself sitting in the Chick-fil-A line and, well, it's just not moving fast enough, even though in reality, you're not having to do anything. I mean, you're just sitting there placing your order and letting other people cook you the best chicken ever. But you find yourself getting a little agitated because, again, fast food's not fast enough. Do, do you find yourself sitting down after a long day and you grab your computer, your TV, and, and you, you open up your favorite streaming app, whether it's Netflix or Hulu or YouTube or whatever it might be, and all of a sudden as you, well, as you sit down to watch your favorite show, you get that spinning wheel of death. You know, it's buffering and buffering and buffering. You see, I, I live in an area where I pay for Wi-Fi I mean, I pay a lot of money for Wi-Fi that, well, usually doesn't work. And I know that doesn't sound logical, but I pay for it thinking that maybe one day it will actually speed up. I find myself wanting to stream my favorite show, and when the Wi-Fi I, I pay for, the internet I pay for, isn't working, I will click off the internet, and I will uh, tether it to my, my phone using my phone as a hotspot, thinking that that would speed it up. I'm such not a patient person. Do you find yourself standing in a line? Any line. I mean, you name what you're waiting for, but it doesn't matter what you're waiting for. It could be you know, to get those concert tickets for your favorite band, your favorite show. It doesn't matter. It could be standing in line for that one item that you've been wanting to purchase. It doesn't matter the line, but you find yourself looking ahead and you're actually trying to find different lines, seeing if you can get in a line that's gonna move a bit faster. Do you find yourself at the airport standing in the security line and you're scoping it out and you're actually now looking at people thinking, well, that person is gonna go really slow through security, so you choose a different line. Do you find yourself in a line and it just makes you agitated? Do you find yourself standing right outside of an elevator and you go and you push the up button and you just wait and there's a second click by, you get more and more frustrated as you have to wait. How many seconds as you wait for that elevator to come and open up, how many seconds do you think you will wait before you just get really frustrated? Well, there's a group of people that actually studied that. And they said after 20 seconds, 20 seconds, that's all, the average person becomes agitated, frustrated if the elevator doesn't arrive. And my last non-scientific question. When there's two-day delivery, is that not fast enough? I mean, Christmas is coming and a whole lot of people are going to be ordering online. And well, I find myself going, really, two days? Can it, can it be a day and a half? Can it just get here a little, a little quicker? Well, I sat down uh, and I took three different internet patient quizzes. They were all different and they were all, well, they all were going to give me the results for how patient or impatient I was. And after I got done with these three quizzes, well, they kind of told me what I already knew. The first quiz I got done, I submitted my results and all of a sudden popped up on the screen. It was a very nice message. The message was, Patient isn't your strongest virtue, my friend. I think that my friend was trying to, to kind of to mellow it out a bit, but I'm like, yeah, it's true. Patience isn't my virtue. The second result, again, I hit submit and all of a sudden the screen popped up and it simply said, you are 10% patient, 10%. Like I was like, I knew I was impatient, but that's pretty low. And then the third quiz I took, same thing, I submitted my results and all of a sudden the screen pops up and it simply said, 
not patient at all. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's that's probably the, the truth out, out of all three of them. I'm just not a patient person. Are you a patient person? Well, we're in this series titled Hope Rising, and this series is going to guide us through, well, Advent. And the word Advent simply means coming. And so many times when we think about Advent, when we talk about Advent, it gets connected to, well, Christmas, the, the birth of Jesus. And that's, that's definitely a part of Advent. But there's two other components of Advent that we need to stare at. One of them is one day Jesus, the risen king, is going to come back to this earth. And the other one is, well, Jesus desires to have a personal relationship with you. Jesus wants to come near, come close to you. In the time we have together, we're going to be focusing on, well, especially those two other aspects of Advent. Jesus is the risen king coming and the desire for Jesus to come close to everyone. Now, there's going to be five different well, kind of key aspects that we're going to attach to Advent that's going to help us fully understand what Advent's all about. In part one, we looked at promises that God is who he says he is, and God's going to do everything that he says he's going to do, that we can count on God. And well, in fact, we have this incredible story, we call it the Bible, but it's filled with God's promises that over thousands of years, what God has said is going to happen has happened. And so we can trust that what God is, is, is saying is going to happen in the future is actually going to happen. And the second component, what we're going to be looking at today is, well, this word patience. In fact, uh, Peter, who was a disciple and apostle of Jesus, Peter, who walked with Jesus. I mean, Peter was minding his own business. He was fishing. He was building his business. He was just taking care of himself. And one day Jesus intersected with his life and everything changed for Peter. Peter's actually uh, going to be talking about both of these aspects of promises and patience. In fact, uh, we're going to be looking at the very end of well, what we call a book of the Bible. It was actually a letter written by Peter to Christ followers. And then at the very end of 2 Peter, uh, Peter's going to tie these two aspects of promises and patience together. What we know is Peter wrote this, this specific letter somewhere between 64 and 68 AD. And Peter was killed for his faith, for being a Christ follower, somewhere right in that 67 to 68 AD time frame. So this was one of the last things Peter wrote. And Peter knew, Peter knew that his life, his time on this earth was coming to an end. So as you think about this, well, 64 to 68 AD time frame, remember this. And this is going, well, this is going to help will create a framework around, especially the patience word. You see, if Peter's writing around 64 to 68 AD, what we do know is about 30 years earlier is when Jesus walked on this earth and he was crucified and buried and God raised him from the dead. So there's only approximately a 30 year gap between these words that Peter wrote and well, Jesus living on this earth and and doing his miracles and teaching and crucified and being buried and God raising him from the dead. 30 years. Now, for you and me, it's some 2,000 years later. So with that in your framework, well, let's jump into what, what Peter wrote. He said, but don't, don't forget about this one thing. This one thing. Again, he's bringing this entire letter to a conclusion. And he's like, hey, friend, there's one thing I just want to highlight. This one thing I just want to make sure that, that you don't forget, that you don't miss. And he goes, with the Lord, and maybe these are words that you've heard before. You just maybe didn't know where in the Bible they came from or that they actually came from the Bible. He said, with the Lord, a day is like a, a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. I mean, that statement in of itself sets the tension that, well, the time frame you and I operate on are, 
our clock and our stopwatches and our alarms and how we see our time is vastly different than how God sees time. Our very narrow scope of life looks vastly different than the God who's well, always been here and will always be. And then Peter writes something that, that, that we need to hold on to. You see, Peter writes, he goes, he goes, the Lord is not, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness. Have you ever felt that God is just slow? Have you ever felt like you've been praying for something and, and you've literally said, hey, hey God, like, could you please speed up a bit? Could you uh, please move it in fast forward? Have you ever felt that God's timing was, well, was just way off according to your time? I know for me, I've had many of these moments where I've just asked God, hey, God, could you please speed the answer up? Hey, God, I know you're working, but could you work a little faster? Hey, God, I need an answer now, not tomorrow or not the next day. Now would be good for me. And there's times where just in this silence as I'm talking with God, I just feel God kind of say, yeah, 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 guess what, Chris? I'm working, but my pace is different than what you want it to be. My pathway looks vastly different than what you want it to look like. Hey, Chris, my clock is different than your clock. And Peter's like, how God moves and how God interacts most of the time is different than, well, how we would want him to. And then Peter writes, instead, instead, he is patient with you. And so he's going to bring this group of Christ followers back to, well, their spiritual journey. Peter said, hey, there, there's a point where, where you weren't following Jesus, but now you are following Jesus. He said, hey, remember that, that, that there was a moment where, where Jesus, well, you were just doing your own thing. And then all of a sudden you placed your trust, placed your faith in Jesus. And remember, Jesus was patient with you. Why? Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. And that word Perish means to be separated from God. You see, when you place your trust, your faith in Jesus, it's not about like heaven and pearly gates. It's about being in the presence of God the Father. And well, for those that don't place their trust, their faith in Jesus, there's separation from God the Father. But then Peter writes, but, but every to come to repentance. Remember, one of God's promises through Abraham, was for all people, all nations. And that Jesus came and died for all people, all nations, for those who put their faith to put their trust in Jesus. And Peter's like, hey, this is about everyone, everyone having an opportunity to name Jesus the subject of their and then Peter starts to write something. And again, this doesn't feel like that joyful Christmas part of the Christmas story, but it's true. He said, but the day of the Lord will come like a, like a thief. In fact, Peter took these words from Jesus himself. He said, hey, God's going to come like a thief in the night. You're not going to know when, but it's going to happen. In fact, Jesus well, he himself said he didn't know when that day was going to be. Only God the Father knows. And Peter writes, he goes, the heavens will disappear with a roar. And he uses this very descriptive word roar that means something moving rapidly through the air. I don't know if you've ever been to an air show before or if you've ever uh, had, a, you know, like, uh, the blue angels of fly overhead. But if you've ever experienced that, you know, as those fighter jets fly low overhead, right? There's nothing like feeling that sound, feeling the air, feeling, feeling that roar. 
And I think for Peter, if he would have ever experienced fighter jets flying overhead, like that would have been the image. He said, hey, we'll disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. I mean, since everything will be destroyed in this way. Peter said, what, what, kind, of, what kind of people ought you to be? I mean, Peter's just painted a, a pretty bleak picture. But he turns it back to these Christ followers. And he's like, hey, how are you to live? And he goes, I'll tell you how you, you're to live. You, you ought to live holy and godly lives. What he's saying is your lifestyle, your daily life, every day how you live should be holy and god, godly. We talk about it at, 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 at TCC about... We, we desire to love like Jesus and to live like Jesus and to lead like Jesus. I mean, that, that's the framework. I mean, if we just get loving like Jesus right, this world would be a vastly different place. And so we want to love like him and we want to live like him. Remember, Jesus came as a servant to serve people. I mean, that's a great act of love when you put that towel over your arm and you look for well, the needs of other people and how we treat one another and how we interact one another and how we, well, accept one another. And Peter's like, hey, you live a lifestyle that reflects God's heart. Live holy lives. Perfection? No. That's not the goal. It's, it's a pursuit to live a life reflecting Jesus. And then he says, as you look forward, as you look forward to the day of God, the speed that is coming. So in one moment, Peter's talking about the slowness. But then he's like, but there's a speed because it's coming. This day that only God the Father knows is coming, that the risen King Jesus is coming. And that day will bring about the destruction of heavens by fire and the elements will melt in heat. He goes on and he writes, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward, right? There's a bad part of this day, but he goes, with God's promise, do you know what's coming with his promise? A new heaven and a new earth. Peter's like, there's going to be a day when King Jesus, the risen king, is going to establish a new heaven and new earth. And in that place, no more pain. In that new heaven and new, new earth, no more cancer. In that new heaven and new earth, no more worry, no more anxiety. In that new heaven and new earth, no more loneliness. In that new heaven and new earth, it's going to be a perfect place. With the risen King Jesus and God, the Father. And Peter says, so friends, since you're looking forward to this, and that is something to look forward to. That day without pain, that day without anxiety, that day without worry, that day without cancer, that day without loss, that day without loneliness, there's something to look forward to. He says, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Again, how you live. But Peter doesn't stop there. And this, this is what we can't miss. If you are a Christ follower, you, you have to hold on to this next thought. You got to pay attention to this next thought. Because it's so easy as Christ followers for us, well, to only look at the, the looking forward part, the only paying attention to Jesus coming again, the only paying attention to the new heaven and the new, new earth. And Peter, approximately 30 years later, that's only 30 years after Jesus left this earth. He goes, hey, hey, hey. bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. The same patience that God has with you. You see, if you're a Christ follower, 
Again, it's, it's important to look forward. There's something about knowing that there is a new earth, a new heaven. There's something about a risen King Jesus where everything we're experiencing on this earth is going to go away. And we will be living in perfection with God the Father. But as we look forward, we can't overlook now. I hear Jesus' followers say, well, Jesus just come now. Jesus just come now. Jesus just come now. And if you're one of those people saying that, my encouragement, same as Peter's encouragement, is yes, look forward, but don't overlook now because God's patience now is about salvation. That God is waiting for the very last moment. I mean, his son, the risen King Jesus, is coming. It's going to happen. It's one of his promises. But God's patience is, is, is because he wants to allow every single person, everyone, an opportunity to name Jesus the subject of their life. If you're a Christ follower, don't overlook now, even as you look out to our broken world, even as you look about your pain and, and in your loneliness and your worry and your anxiety and everything you're facing, be thankful that God is a patient God and he is slowing it all down so that every single person has an opportunity to name Jesus the subject of their life. You see, our temporary and momentary struggles its what they are. If you trust in Jesus, we know what's coming. And that's why we must love like Jesus now. That's why we must live like Jesus now. It's why we must lead like Jesus now. And that's why we must leave behind what Jesus left behind which is more people to love, live, and lead like Jesus. Yes, look forward. But don't overlook now. You see, I'm thankful that we have a patient God. A patient God that's waiting, that's waiting, so that every person has an opportunity to name Jesus as Lord and Savior. Every person. And you see that, that's why the church, a gathering of imperfect, messy people, is so important. Because it's through the church, you and me, that we Hold on to God's purpose to share with all people about His Son, Jesus. It's why this Christmas season is such an amazing season. Because it's in this season where people are more open to listening, where people are more open to lean in, where people are more open to have a conversation about Jesus. The words that we're holding on to as a, as a guide for, well, this entire series is the words Paul wrote in Romans chapter 15, where Paul said, may the God of hope, confident hope, hope with an exclamation point, hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. His joy, his peace, has nothing to do with what's going on around you. This is what God does in you and through you. As you trust in him, as you place your faith in him, as you believe in him and remember, it's not about the quantity of your faith. No, no, no. It's who you've placed your faith in, a God of hope so that you may overflow 
with hope by the power of God the Spirit. This week, every day, say those words. As you wake up in the morning, say those words. As you drive to school, drive to work, say those words. As you encounter overwhelming, uncertain moments, say those words. Hold on to the God of hope that He will fill you with joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope, God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope. Not by your power, but by the power of God, the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful that you are a patient God. Yes, as we want to look forward to that day, Lord, thank you for being patient to give us every opportunity to share your Son with every single person. Lord, thank you for being a patient God. Waiting, waiting, because your love drives you to wait. Your grace drives you to wait. So may we hold on to your promises, and may we reflect your patience. In your name I pray, amen.